turn to Revelation chapter 4. Um, you know, as I was praying, you know, we see so many in this world that are without hope. And, you know, the, the kind of hope we see in the world around us is, um, you know, why so many people play the lottery. I just saw the mega millions, like $800 million, some crazy thing. And, and, and people, you know, that's kind of where their hope lies, you know, wanting to become a millionaire, wanting to get something for nothing, basically. And they'll, you know, buy a ticket or two or a hundred, just hoping that their numbers are called. And they might get excited for a moment. Oh, 25. Yay, I got that number. 37. Oh, yes, there it is. And then, you know, 42. No, nope, don't have that. So their hope is dashed for that week. And what a sad thing because, you know, the, the chances – and I just read this, the chances of winning the mega million, you know, the big thing, it's, you have a 20,000 times greater chance of being struck by lightning than winning the mega million lotto. And yet people are still putting their hope in those things. I mean, this world is really without hope. And we've seen a, a sad picture of that the last two and a half years or so with the um, pandemic. I mean, pandemic. Um, when you look at the lockdown, at the height of the lockdown of the pandemic, um, and I just saw this stat recently, 16 to 19-year-olds, just that group, out of 100,000 16 to 19-year-olds, one died of COVID. That same period of time, that same group of 16 to 19-year-olds, 30 committed suicide. So suicide was 30 times worse for those who... Um, had no hope during the lockdown. I mean, our hope is in Jesus Christ. Hopefully that is your hope as a believer in Jesus. We long for, we look forward to seeing him face to face. And so the Bible encourages us to walk by faith and not by sight. And we do that by reading, trusting, uh, heeding the word of God. We're given a taste, we're given a sampling of how glorious heaven is going to be. And um, I, I've said it before, it's like an appetizer. And you can Google the word appetizer, and this is the definition. Um, if you don't know, it's a small dish of food eaten before the main course of a meal that stimulates one's appetite. Well, that's what we see in the book of Revelation. We're given an appetizer, so to speak, of the glories of heaven. You know, this should stimu stimulate our hearts, our minds to want to be closer to Jesus, wanting to see him face to face. As much as we want to see the Lord, he is anxious to see us as well. And uh, in John 17, as you read that prayer of Jesus, he is praying, looking forward to catching us home to be with him in glory. It's a beautiful picture. Paul says this, and we can all relate to this, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly. Some versions say we see through a glass dimly. But then, when we get to heaven, face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And so without a doubt, the very best is yet to come. You know, we see through that glass dimly. We see, yeah, we know it's going to be good. We read about how glorious it's going to be as we look at the Word of God. But we still, in these little BB brains of ours, these fallen nature bodies of ours, we cannot comprehend how good and glorious it's going to be. But all the apostles, they look forward to that day of being with Christ, seeing Him face to face. Look at these verses. Titus 2.13, Paul says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.21, Paul says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, in this body, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, so much better to be in the presence of Jesus. We don't comprehend it again, and yet that's Paul's hope. He was caught up into the third heaven. He saw things. He said it's not even 
lawful for me to write about what I saw in glory. And so it's almost like the Lord said, okay, I'll use John then. So John writes about the things he sees in glory. Paul didn't do it, but Paul had that, that blessed hope. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. This is written by the Lord's half-brother. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so by faith, we are patiently waiting for Jesus. What a blessed hope we have. This is what the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, says in 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are children of God. So if you're born again, you belong to Jesus, you are his child. You are a child of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, in Jesus, purifies himself just as he is pure. And so a blessed hope, a purifying hope. What does the Apostle Peter say about this? He gives us quite a description. First Peter, start, uh, First Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, or caused us to be born again, to a living hope. Why is it a living hope? Well, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We don't have just a wishful thinking, well, I hope there's a heaven. I hope there's something better when I'm done here on earth. No, it's a living hope, and it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this is what he's got in store for us, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. And that's a reservation Jesus will keep for us, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So we're still in this world, we're still in a fallen world, a lot of unbelievers, a lot of junk around us. And so, if need be, he says, You'll go through these various trials, but it's for a purpose that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, so it doesn't matter how much gold you've bought over the last few years, it will perish. Though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. We haven't seen him. I've never seen Jesus, but I love him because this is what he's revealed to us in his word, all that he is, who he is, what he's done for us. Though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith when everything's done, the salvation of your souls. And that's referring to the glorification we will experience in his presence. So we have a blessed hope, Paul tells us, a purifying hope. John tells us we have a living hope, as Peter tells us. And I believe the, the first thing we see when we get to heaven is God's throne room of grace and glory. And as we'll see, uh, as we go through Revelation, both the Father and the Son, Jesus, sit upon this throne. As you know, we don't have to wait until we die to go to this throne room of glory. Um, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that we are seated presently with Christ in the heavenly places. That's our position. Spiritually, we're with him. But we're also able, through the Spirit, go into his presence anytime, 24-7. This is what uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 tells us. Let us therefore come boldly, not arrogantly, that means confidently, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
And so we have spiritual access to God's throne room today. Um, but again, a time is coming when we will no longer see through the glass dimly, but then face to face. So chapter four, look at the first couple verses here. We're not going to get all the way through this chapter, if you were wondering. It's like you're taking forever to get to verse one. After these things, Paul said, or John writes, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard, was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. This takes us back to the outline of the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 19. This is where Jesus gives John the outline. And we saw, if you want to look at that, Jesus tells him, write the things which you have seen, past tense. What did he just see? Chapter 1, he saw the glorified vision of Jesus. And that description of Jesus, you know, his voice like the sound of many waters, you know, uh, it was, out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword. It was amazing. So this is the outline that he gives us there. If you get the outline wrong, and many people do, the rest of the book of Revelation will not make any sense. People will start plugging in weird stuff. Oh, in 1090, this pope did this, and it's like right here. It's like, no. This is the outline that we have in the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 19. Write the things which you've seen, past tense. Then Jesus tells him, write the things which are, and the things which are, we are told, are the seven churches, present tense. That's what we spent chapters 2 and 3, seven weeks. We looked at the seven churches. Those are the things which are. The things which are, present tense, the church age from uh, Pentecost to the rapture, which could be any time now, uh, for about 2,000 years, we've been in this time that which, the things which are. And so, right now, today, we're still living in that church age. But then Jesus says at the end of verse 19 of chapter 1, that John needs to write the things which will take place after this. That phrase, after this, the Greek words are meta, tauta, and it means after this or after these things. Again, verse 1 here in chapter 4 says after these things, metatauta. And at the end of verse 1 he says, which must take place after this, metatauta. This is the third part of the outline. This begins the third section of the book of Revelation. From this point on in chapter 4 verse 1, there's no mention of the church on earth. From this point on, in chapter 4, verse 1, we're going to see things from the vantage point of heaven. Uh, from this point on, everything is in the future, things which will take place after this. So John has just finished writing his seven letters to the seven churches. Jesus dictated those letters to him. And all of a sudden, we see here, he is immediately caught up into heaven. But he sees, first of all, he sees a door open in heaven, and then he's immediately caught up. Now, Jesus told us, we saw in chapter 3, the Church of Philadelphia, he says, I open doors and no one can shut. I close doors and no one can open. We see this is an open door into heaven. By the way, you need to let people in the world that aren't saved know that heaven is still open to them today. God has not closed this door yet. People can still get saved. They can still have the living, blessed hope of being with Jesus for eternity. So that door is still open. Jesus is the only door. We saw this in John chapter 9, uh, 10, verse 9. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the only way to heaven. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way. That means the only way. I am the truth, the only truth. I am the life, the only life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So again, that door into heaven is still open to anyone who will turn to Christ. 
Receive Him as Lord and Savior. You turn from your sin, you turn to Jesus, He will receive you, you will become a child of God, but it's important to trust Christ sooner rather than later because the day is coming when the body of Christ is complete, the bride of Christ is complete, the church is complete, He's going to remove us, take us home to be with Him, and then that particular door is going to be shut. It's going to be the time for the Great Tribulation. Let's see uh, what happened here with John. First, it says he hears the first voice, which was like a trumpet. Some versions say John heard the voice of the trumpet that he first heard. The only mention of a trumpet in Revelation at this point, you can look back at chapter 1, verse 10. This is when Jesus comes in his glorified state, and he comes up behind John, and it says in chapter uh, 1, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. And then who speaks? Jesus. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches. And so that's what John has just done. He, he wrote those down, and now he sees or hears this trumpet, and then he's told here, come up here. I have a red letter edition, but these words in verse 1 are not in red letter, but I think they should be. Red letter doesn't mean anything. It's all God's word. But I think this is Jesus saying, come up here. That's what's going to happen at the rapture, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And then again, immediately John was in the Spirit He's in heaven. I don't know about you, but this sounds a lot like the rapture of the church to me. An instantaneous catching up to be in the presence of the Lord. Look at these verses, 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So there's the trumpet. Dead in Christ, those who've died over the last 2,000 years in Jesus, caught up to be with the Lord first. Then we, who are alive and remain, so if the, if the trumpet sounded today, that would be us. We are alive, we're remaining, shall be caught up together with them, those who've died in Christ, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So here, John, in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, I, I think we have John's personal experience with this prophetic event known as the rapture. One minute, he's writing chapters 2 and 3 on the island of Patmos, then immediately, boom, he's in the presence of the Lord at the very throne room of God. And that's what he sees from this point on in chapters 4 and 5. He sees what's going on at the throne of God. This, this pattern is important because Jesus has just finished speaking to the seven churches, represents the complete church age. And then the Lord's voice, which is a loud trumpet, calls John up into glory. And all that takes place before the Great Tribulation. This is important because the Great Tribulation begins in chapter 6. So we will go up to be with the Lord before the Great Tribulation starts. That's the exact same pattern, I believe, is right before us today. The church age is coming to an end very quickly. When the last person gets saved, last person says yes to Jesus or however that takes place, boom, we're out of here. The Lord's going to call his bride to be with him, and, and then those left behind will face the seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation. As we'll, as we'll see in chapter 19, Jesus will come back riding on a white horse, and we come back with him riding on white horses, and so we go up to be with him before he comes back to bring an end to the Great Tribulation. We go up at the rapture. We come back at his second coming. Then God's enemies will be dealt with once and for all when Jesus returns, and that's when he establishes his kingdom on earth that will last for 1,000 years. Jesus will literally turn this world and after the seven years of great tribulation, this world is on the brink of annihilation. Jesus says, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. As we go through these judgments of God from chapter 6 through 18, this world is going to be brutalized beyond recognition. Every sea creature will die. All the trees are going to be burned up. 
People can do whatever they want to do to protect and save Mother Earth, but Father God says, nope, I'm wiping it all out. He's the creator. He's the sustainer of life. He will create a new heaven and a new earth, but before he does, he will make this planet that has been devastated by his judgments into a Garden of Eden-like condition for a thousand years. So, at the rapture, it's going to happen so quick that the people left behind will not be able to say, wait, I want to go too. It's too late. All they'll be able to say is, those crazy Christians were right, and they'll be left behind. The rapture is an event that's designed exclusively for, you might say, members only, those of us who belong to Jesus. It's a collection of men, women, boys, girls from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, every color. It doesn't matter what their background is for all those who've said yes to Jesus. They've received him as their Lord and Savior. The one thing we have in common with the body of Christ is we've all been forgiven. And it's because of the blood of the Lamb that he shed on the cross for our sins. And if that describes you, then ready or not, we will be instantly changed at the rapture. I read these things, I study these things, and it's still, you know, my BB brain cannot comprehend how glorious it's going to be. This is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 50. He says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So these bodies, they're not going to heaven. We have to get a new resurrection body, new and improved, because these bodies would vaporize on the way up. So they cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. A mystery is something that was previously hidden, but now has been revealed. So Paul's saying, I'm revealing this to you. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. So we're going to be changed. How fast? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And so from Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, we see that this happens in a millisecond of time. This will take place faster than you can blink. This is why our living hope, our blessed hope, is found only in Jesus. You cannot experience instant change like the moment Christ came into your life. He saved you. You're a new creation in Christ. Boom, that fast. The world has no hope in getting changed. You know, the world says, well, as of last year, they said, we've been here for 13.8 billion years. And they just knocked a billion years off of that if you didn't see it. So now that we've been here for 12.8 billion years, big deal. We haven't been, but that's their thought. We've been here for 12.8 billion years. It's taken us this long, billions, millions of years, to get from swamp goo to you by way of the zoo. And you'll live 80. If you're lucky, you'll live to be 100. Then you die and turn to, turn to worm food. And that's when you stop existing again. That's no hope. What kind of hope is that? That's why people say, eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow I die, because they have no hope in eternity. The vain philosophies of men, all the false religions of men, the Eastern religions of men, they're no better. You know, you go to, we go to India, the Hindus there, they think, oh, you know, you're going to have all these reincarn thousands of reincarnations, you know, to get from that little swamp bug to a slug to a kitty or a dog or whatever, and you, you eventually get to nirvana. That's their hope. Nirvana means the state of nothingness. <laughs> How do you even know if you get there? It's a state of nothingness. That, there's no hope in that. It's going to take you thousands of all these eons of time to maybe become something where you turn into nothing. It, it's so sad. That's the world's hope. Um, growing up, you know, I was born in 56 and, you know, through the 60s, I was a big Beatles fan. and Some of you probably were or you hated them. You know, I was a big fan of George Harrison because I was kind of mystical. And when the Beatles broke up and he came out with his uh, unprecedented three album set, um, All Things Must Pass, three album set. And it was all of his compilation of songs because, you know, Paul and uh, John didn't like his music very much. So they'd give him one song here and there. So he comes out with three albums all in one set. 
And it was, it was, I mean, at the time, I thought that was great. I bought it. I was all into the Eastern mysticism stuff. And one of the best songs on there, one of the best, but one of the songs that became very popular, My Sweet Lord. Some of you remember that song, My Sweet Lord. And part of the lyric is, My Sweet Lord, I just want to see you. I really want to be with you. But it takes so long, my Lord. And then I get saved in 77. I realize, well, he wasn't singing about the Lord. He's singing it to Hare Krishna. Krishna was his God. And so when he says, but it takes so long, my Lord, I really want to be with you. I really want to see you, but it takes so long because it's all about being reincarnated. There's no hope in that. It's just so sad. That's where the world is. The beauty of Christianity and being in Christ, the hope, the reality that we have is there's no luck involved. There's no amount of good works involved. There's no amount of good deeds we have to try to do to somehow make ourselves holy and righteous. In fact, as Christians, we realize we can never make ourselves holy and righteous, even if we were given a billion years to do it. You think I would make myself holy and righteous? No, neither would you. It's impossible. But we know that when Jesus came into our lives, he made those radical changes instantly. He changed us from darkness to light, from death. He's given us life, and he's made us new creations. When he saved us, it was forever and ever. We will be changed instantly in a twinkling of an eye. That's living hope. that we're going to see him face to face in glory. So when you think about it, only Jesus can make those real changes in our lives for today. Only he can make those lasting changes that will last for eternity. And only Jesus can wipe away our crummy past that many of us have had. Many of you have experienced horrible things. He's erased that. So again, look at verse 2. He says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. When John is caught up into heaven, the first thing he sees is God sitting on this throne. As we go through Revelation, we'll see that Jesus also occupies this same throne. The Father and the Son share this throne. It's the seat of authority. It's a seat of absolute power. This is the throne from which God rules and reigns over the entire universe. And what a sight this will be when we see Jesus face to face. The book of Revelation could also be called the book of thrones. Uh, the word throne is used 60 times in the New Testament. 45 times it's used in the book of Revelation. So 75% of every time you read the word throne, it's here in the book of Revelation. This book is truly a book that reveals the ultimate authority, the sovereignty of God like no other book. And, and, and because of this fact, we know for certain that God is going to bring about everything that he has declared in his word. Every prophecy will come to pass. Every prophecy will be fulfilled exactly as God's word declares. Now, the amazing thing to me is the same sovereign Lord and Savior who sits on this ultimate throne in glory also sits upon the throne of our hearts. He rules and reigns in our lives. At least he better be. He should be. If he's not, if you're still on the throne of your own life, if you're still telling God what to do and how to do it, then he is not your Lord and Savior. But when we come to Christ, part of coming to Christ is saying to him, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I give you my life. I can't run my life. I mess it up time and time again. I surrender everything to you because you're the supreme ruler. And so I ask you, Lord, sit upon the throne of my heart, my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Again, there's no one better to rule our lives than the one who created us. He knows you better than he knows himself. He has a plan and purpose for your lives better than anything you could ever come up with. And so that's part of faith is just trusting him to lead you and guide you. A common mistake that I've made, I'm sure you've made as well, is when we try to wiggle back up on the throne of our lives. Uh, I kind of nudge the Lord over and say, okay, I got it from here, Jesus. And he'll say, okay. You know, crash and burn, you know, whatever. And, and then you realize, okay, I don't want to do this, Lord. <laughs> you need to take over. 
you know, it's amazing that when we, it's like, you know, that old Carrie Underwood song, let Jesus take the wheel. We need to let Jesus take the wheel. Let him steer, let him drive. Just sit there next to him and say, good job, Lord. You're amazing what you're doing. And I just want to let you keep driving this life of mine. So let him rule and reign and lead you and guide you from the throne of your life. Notice how the Apostle John describes the Lord who sits on the throne. Look at verse 3. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So how does John describe the one who sits upon the throne? Basically, he describes him as being indescribable. <laughs> All he can describe is these amazing colors just emanating from the throne, just bright light. The jasper stone is like a clear diamond. That's how he sees him, just the light just radiating purity. Uh, the sardius stone is like a ruby red stone. Again, if Jesus is sharing this throne with the Father, that might speak of the blood of Christ, you know, and what he's done for us. Just emanating from the throne, just the beauty, the splendor of God's glory. Notice it says John sees an emerald rainbow encircling the throne. So all this emerald green color rainbow. We usually picture arches for a rainbow, like when um, Noah got off the ship, the ark, you know, God placed a rainbow in the sky and it was a promise that he would never destroy the earth with a flood of water again. Next time it's with fire, but that promise is the rainbow. I won't destroy the earth with water and God will always keep his promise. But this is almost like a halo, you know, because it says it encircles the throne. So it's either like a halo. I heard one commentator say maybe it's circling all the way around this way around the throne. Well, we don't know but it's going to be glorious. This is important to understand, though, because in the rainbow we see God's covenant. The rainbow was his promise to all of us, mankind, that he was not going to destroy the flood uh, with the flood of water again, but he always keeps his promise. Here we see... You know, just God in his sovereignty, seated on the throne, but we also see his grace and mercy. Sovereignty, we're going to see all these noises, sounds, thunder, lightning from the throne. And it makes you think, man, I don't know if I should go there. That's kind of scary. But he is also a God of grace and mercy. And that's what this rainbow emphasizes to us. His covenant of grace. That's important. And I think the reason why is best described to me um, by C.H. Spurgeon. This is how he sums up this scene. Spurgeon says, O oh, child of God, the Heavenly Father in His sovereignty has a right to do with you, His child, as He pleases. I look at that and go, yeah, he, I deserve to be smacked, knocked out of the kingdom of God. I'm such an idiot. But, this is what Spurgeon says, he will never let that sovereignty get out of the limit of the covenant, his promises. As a sovereign God, he might cast you away, but he has promised that he never will, and never will he. As a sovereign, he might leave you to perish. That's what I deserve. But he has promised, I will not leave you nor forsake you. As a sovereign, he might allow you to be tempted beyond your strength, but he has promised that no temptation shall, sh shall happen to you, but such as is common to man, and he will, with the temptation, make a way of escape, end quote. I mean, that's so true. He is sovereign. He can do what he wants. He's God, but he's also given us these promises of his grace, his mercy, that he loves us, and we're going to be with him forever and ever. Look at verse 4. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold 
on their heads. And so the next thing he sees, these 24 elders, they got little thrones around the throne of God. The question is always, who are the 24 elders and why are there only 24 of them? Um, the best explanation I've heard that I can come up with, because there's a thousand different explanations for this, is these 24 elders represent the entire church. Um, what they're doing, what they're wearing, is what Jesus promised to the overcomers in those seven letters. Remember in chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus said, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. In chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus said, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, as we see here. Chapter 2, verse 10, Jesus tells the church of Smyrna, I will give you the crown of life. And so we have 24 elders, 24 thrones, uh, clothed in white garments. They got crowns on their heads. By the way, these same elders are singing a song to Jesus in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, that only the church can sing, and we'll see why when we get there. It says, For you are slain, talking about Jesus, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Again, why only 24? I think the answer is found in First Chronicles 23 and 24, where David, as he's setting up, preparing for the temple that Solomon would build, they would have 24,000 priests that would work in the temple, but only 24 could be in the temple at any given time. So those 24 always represent the larger number of 24,000. So be that as it may, John sees 24 elders around the throne as representatives of the rest of the overcomers. They represent all of us who have overcome by the blood of the Lamb through God's grace, through faith in Jesus. Again, when we get to chapter 5, we'll see billions of people around the throne plus who knows how many angels around the throne and we will all be worshiping the Father and the Son. So an amazing scene that we'll look at. Look at verse 5. He says, And from the throne, God's throne, proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So again, he sees these tremendous sights and sounds, lightning, thundering, voices. This is reminiscent of God's glorious appearance on Mount Sinai when he's given the law to Moses. Same thing happened. There was lightning, thundering, um, the, the mountain shook, the people down below were terrified. Notice he also sees here seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. This is the third time we've seen this, the seven spirits of God before the throne. Number seven, the number of completion, used 64 times in the book of Revelation. This is a complete picture of the Holy Spirit. What we're seeing here is the real deal. This is the Holy of Holies. When we get to chapter 21 and 22, as he describes New Jerusalem, that's the Holy of Holies, the throne in the middle, and then all the other things that accompany that. When you look at that, God told Moses, this is what you're going to build, the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a model of what we're looking at here. In the tabernacle, they had the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the seat of mercy, that's God's throne. You had the seven candle you know, lampstand in the temple that represents the seven spirits before the throne, which is the Holy Spirit that was lit. It had to be lit perpetually. That was the only light in the temple. Zechariah chapter four, when Zechariah is given that vision of an automated system that took the oil from the two olive trees, sent it directly to the lampstand, Zechariah saw in this vision this perpetual burning lampstand. Zechariah 4, 6 says, For he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So again, here in Revelation 4, John is seeing the real deal in heaven, not Moses' model that he was instructed to build. And so the fire of the Holy Spirit burning brightly before the throne of God so a beautiful description of the Holy Spirit. He's complete. He's powerful. He's the one that has done everything for us. He sealed us into the body of Christ. He has given us whatever gifts and talents you have. 
They're gifts of the Holy Spirit. He's given you the fruit of the Holy Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, you know, all those blessed, you know, fruit of the Spirit. He's the one who brings the Word of God to life within our hearts. He's the one who convicts us of our sins. If we start to drift or wander, He convicts us and brings us back to the Lord. So, He's the Spirit of truth. He's the Spirit of wisdom. The Bible says He's the Spirit of power and holiness, the Spirit of counsel. And so, this is what we're seeing here. God on His throne, the Holy Spirit in the presence of of God there in this seven lamps. Finally, verse 6, we'll close here. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. We will look at those creatures next week, living beings. They're not weird. Well, they are weird. He's going to say they're not weird creatures, but they actually are. They're pretty amazing when we'll look at those. But take note of this. Well, this is the last thing I'll mention here. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass like crystal. Another item in the earthly temple, the tabernacle, and then Solomon's temple, then Herod's temple, they had a bronze laver. It was full of water. It was known as the sea basin at times. It was just this big basin of water. The priests would wash their hands in there before they would do their service unto the Lord. Here we see a sea of glass like crystal. In other words, there's no water. You don't put your hands in anything. It's solid. Why? Because we're all cleansed. There's no need for cleansing. We'll, we'll be there. We'll be cleansed in His presence. We'll be sinless in His presence. Here we see this huge sea of glass like crystal. We'll all be forgiven. All made righteous. And it's all because of what Jesus did on the cross. He shed His blood. He died in our place. He paid the price for our sins. And so we'll be standing on solid ground because we'll see later on, we'll be standing on this sea of crystal before the Lord. Even today, if you are a new creation in Christ, you are standing on solid ground. Jesus is what? The rock of our salvation. <laughs> or you're on shifting sand. That's not solid. You know, when the storms of life hit, it'll crumble because that house was built on sand, not on the solid rock. Listen, are you trying to clean up your life from your past sins and failures, thinking that you can somehow make it to heaven in your own efforts? Realize Jesus did everything for you. He paid the price that you can never pay. He shed his blood, which is the only acceptable payment for our sins and it's only by turning to christ that you can be forgiven you can be cleansed you can be turned into a new creation and he will give you the free gift of everlasting life that's a choice that you must make for yourself he stands at the door and knocks if anyone will hear his voice he'll open the door he's not going to kick the door in you must open the door to jesus I don't remember where I saw this years ago. It may have been Greg Laurie, but he had four R's. You know, if you want to know where you stand with the Lord or you want to get saved, first R is realize. Realize, I'm a sinner. I need salvation. I need to be forgiven. I'm doomed without God. So realize that. Recognize, the second R, recognize Jesus loves you. He demonstrated his love for you by going to the cross and dying in your place. He took upon himself the wrath and judgment you deserve, I deserve for our sins. Again, that's why he cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He'll never leave us or forsake us because Jesus was forsaken in our place. Realize, recognize, then the third thing is repent. You recognize you're a sinner. You know, you, you, you recognize Jesus loves you. You repent. You turn from those things that are trying to destroy your life. You turn your life over to Jesus. And then the fourth R is receive. Receive Christ. Ask Him to come into your life. Ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. Ask Him to wash your sins away. And He promises He will. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him. You're a whoever. King, old King James says, whosoever, so whosoever believes in him. doesn't matter what your background, doesn't matter what you've done, whosoever believes in him should not perish, be destroyed, that's what perish means, but have everlasting life. Mm -hmm.